All right. Uh, I guess I get an extra minute. That's good news. Open stack in the wild. Thanks for coming, you guys. Um, this is kind of a fun topic for me to talk about. I've been attending these open stack summits for a long time, and uh, it's just in the last couple of years, it's starting to got to the point where we're out talking with customers, um, and they say, "Hey, we're trying this open stack stuff in our in our enterprise, and it's pretty exciting." So we're seeing spottings in the wild, um, and we've kind of shifted. Our company shifted from evangelist to now we're going and actually implementing stuff when clients are asking us to. So it's pretty excited, uh, exciting times. That's why I called this open stack in the wild. Um, but this is really all about how to make OpenStack a reality within your own company. So quick kind of show of hands, how many people are in here are hosting or managed service providers? Hosting companies managed? OK, so a few. And then how many are from enterprise end users? OK, cool. Um, so hopefully you're going to find this interesting. Just a quick introduction. My name is Grant Kirkwood, and I'm the chief technology officer of Unitas Global. And we are an enterprise cloud service provider. We serve primarily mid to large uh, enterprise organizations worldwide, um, operations on pretty much every continent except Antarctica. Um, and we build large scale cloud environments for companies that are looking to leverage OpenStack and other technologies. So first thing, first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit about the kind of things that we hear out in the space. But first, the four phases of OpenStack adoption within the enterprise. Um, we think that this generally starts with an idea within the enterprise. Um, it then moves into a proof of concept. Then you're actually building for production. And then the fourth most important step is driving adoption. So I call it kind of the four stages of, of OpenStack. So then what do we actually hear from our customers? So we go in and talk to a large global enterprise about what they're looking to do in, in terms of technology. And there's one theme that we hear over and over and over again. Um, <laughs> it's that they're, they're not really making a whole lot of strategic progress. They're kind of keeping up with the day-to-day -day demands. You know, the email system went down, and so they're going to go fix that. And then, you know, the, the Ceph cluster blew up, and now they're trying to rebalance data. Um, but they're not making a lot of strategic process, progress. We hear this a lot, um, particularly in enterprise companies that aren't necessarily uh, technology companies themselves, really. It's, it's manufacturing and retail and finance. So. Then you come to the OpenStack Summit. And, and this has really been true in previous years, not as much this, this year, but you, you, you watch the keynotes and there's these success stories, these really big companies that have made huge progress with OpenStack. Um, at, the, at the last summit, Walmart was one of the, the main presenters uh, and they made the announcement that they went all in for their entire global retail operation. And these are really cool stories to talk about and I love telling them to our enterprise clients um, but the reality is sometimes they're kind of inspirational. They're not necessarily practical for the kind of mid to large enterprise. They're really only practical for the largest at times. So inspirational, but how do you actually translate that into uh, businesses that don't have teams of developers? Before we talk about that, um, I want to talk a little bit about why OpenStack. So we hear a couple of common themes. I like visual aids, by the way, if you can't tell. Um, common themes that we typically hear, and we talk about them here at, at the summit, we hear agility over and over again. Um, agility directly translates into an ability to execute and outperform your peers in any given industry. This is a real common theme in, in kind of business management. So if you have a more agile infrastructure, if you believe that technology becomes more important to running a business, if it's more agile, then your business is more agile, and therefore you're going to be more successful. Next theme, flexibility. <laughs> um, if, if you have an open architecture and you're based on open source software, you have the ability to adjust and become flexible to changing business environments and technologies. Uh, you're not you know, stuck in kind of a predefined box. That's one of the things that I'm really the most excited about with OpenStack. Another really common one is vendor lock-in. Um, and this is huge for us right now in the last 12 months. We've had lots of customers coming to us and saying, hey, you know, we've used vendor XYZ for year after year after year, and they keep kind of extracting their money out of us, um, or our money out of, uh, out of us, and we're kind of done with it. We're done with being stuck with these vendors just because that's the way it's always been done. 
Um, and so OpenStack gives you a way to get out of vendor-supported IT and bring the control back to yourself. Um, and then focus also is really important. So most companies, again, aren't necessarily technology companies. They might be doing other things, but rely heavily on technology. Well, if you're a healthcare provider and you're spending all your time focusing on building data centers and running clouds and making all that work, the nuts and bolts of the infrastructure, you're probably not focusing on the healthcare applications that are actually really important to you. So this is, this is a big one. And I'll tell you, when we have conversations with clients, it never starts with this. They never put their hand up and say, hey, I'd really like to focus on my business more. It's only after you have the conversations, you get past the technology and the, all the other things that this comes up. But that's really important. And then, of course, savings. So a lot of people, I've, I've heard the phrase, you know, OpenStack is free VMware, and that's not the case, right? We're not trying to replace other technologies that, that are on the market. We're trying to do something differently here. Um, but if we ignore the fact that cost savings is really important to all companies, um, then we're not, you know, we're, we're not gonna deliver an effective message. So it, it matters, it really does. So to kind of package that up, if you think about the business drivers, and this is really the context of the conversation as it relates to OpenStack and the enterprise, it has to be because there's a specific business need or an identified driver. So cost, agility equals a greater ability to execute, and then technology. And you'll note that I put technology last. So I'm an engineer, I like technology, but if we make the whole conversation about making technology do cool things, we're gonna lose the business people, right? It's important to focus on what that translates to in terms of the business. It can't be about the science experiment that we all wanna do. So the next step in this, and this is critical, if we talk about how we're gonna do something before we've stated why and before we've built consensus, we're gonna lose the constituents that we're trying to serve in the first place. So you'll hear me refer to this, this theme several times, but defining the why before the how is super important when you're talking to a business about adopting new technologies like OpenStack. So then how do we articulate this into the business? So when we're talking to business executives and managers about why we wanna go do this cool new thing with OpenStack, we've gotta talk about total cost of ownership and return on investment, right? Technology is an enabler of revenue within a business. It used to be viewed as a cost center, um, and there are still businesses that view technology as a cost center, but now increasingly we're seeing companies using technology as a way to enable revenue. So for every dollar that's invested, whether that's CapEx, or OpEx or people's time, which is often the biggest cost, it has to deliver a return to the business. So when you think about the, the money that's invested into OpenStack or any technology initiative, it's gotta, there's gotta have, be a tangible benefit. And then opportunity cost. So getting back to the agility uh, factor, opportunity cost is basically the time that it takes to go take advantage of a new opportunity. If you've got inherently inflexible, rigid infrastructure, you're gonna miss opportunities that you might otherwise capture if you're quick and nimble. And then people. So, and this is, this is gonna have a real big impact in terms of how we choose to implement OpenStack within the enterprise, um, but people are expensive. A lot of IT budgets, you see people as the number one uh, expense uh, in the business. So people translate to time and tran therefore translates to money. So if you're able to save time and be more efficient, um, you're gonna deliver value to the business. So as we build a business case within our enterprise about why we're gonna go take advantage of this cool OpenStack stuff, we have to think in terms of the, the underlying business drivers and the reasons that we're looking at it in the first place. So next, psychology matters. <laughs> and this is, this is also really important. So we've defined kind of why we wanna go do this thing. How do we build consensus? So people typically respond to things more effectively and throw more support behind them when they feel like that idea was their own or that they had a personal investment in coming to that conclusion. So if you tell somebody, hey, this is what we're gonna go do, there might be a, a, you know, defensiveness to that, right? They might not immediately jump on board with you. 
But if they feel like they've been part of the decision making and they've seen the reasons why we might go do something and they've bought into that idea, then, then they might go from being defensive to your most ardent supporter. So if you're able to make the idea the rest of the, the constituents within your organization, if you're able to make it their own, they're going to buy into it more and you're going to achieve consensus. And I'll tell you that achieving consensus with the enterprise is half the battle. If you can get there, then you can, then you can do almost anything on the technology side. So success criteria, super important. If you haven't, going back to kind of the business drivers around ROI and TCO and the benefit that this is going to deliver to the business, if you haven't clearly stated here are the metrics by which we're going to judge how successful we are, you're not really going to get anywhere, right? So you need to think about metrics that are relevant to your business. For example, in the, in the healthcare example, if, there, if you have a specific amount of time that it takes to go and retrieve uh, files and deliver patient data to doctors and hospitals, and you can measurably, demonstrably decrease that time by utilizing open source technologies and having an open stack cloud, then those are the metrics that you need to use and set out in advance as, hey, if we achieve this, we've been successful. So then we talk about you know, how are we actually going to do this. One thing that's really important before you go and start putting a proposal out to the business is figuring out what your team skill sets are. So if you don't know what you can do, how do you know how to build it? So identifying team skill sets. That's my favorite slide. You guys like it? <laughs> all right, so now let's, let's say we've kind of gone through all these steps and now we've actually got buy-in. Um, now it's time to do a proof of concept within our company. So how do we go about that? So famous words, one does not simply do OpenStack. It's actually quite, quite complex and there's lots of different ways to do it. And we're going we're gonna to talk about kind of the pros and cons of all the major ones. So first fundamental question that you have to answer is do we build it or do we buy it? And I'll say this, there are lots of different ways to do each of those, right? It's not like you can just go into a store and buy the OpenStack cloud, and it's not like you can go and just buy a kit and put it together like a set of Legos, right? There's lots of different ways to do this, and there's no one right way. So we're going to kind of talk through the major categories and some of the benefits and, and uh, downsides of each. And for sure, one size does not fit all. So thinking about building and buying, what am I actually talking about? Um, in a build model, generally the themes are you're taking a bunch of stuff and going back to the skill sets, you have people that are capable of putting all the pieces together and building a cloud uh, for your business that meets the objectives that you set out. In a buy model, you're going to a partner or a service provider or an appliance manufacturer and consuming OpenStack. So the, the question is, do you want to go and build OpenStack or do you want to consume it? And I would say that, that the answer to that question has a lot to do with what your business actually is. So if you're in the IT infrastructure business, if you're a hosting company, for example, chances are you probably want to go and build it, right? Um, but if you're like the vast majority of companies, uh, you're probably doing something totally different, and therefore building it might not make sense for you. It could still, but probably not. So the question you have to... I got goofy. If the question you have to answer is, are you fundamentally a technology infrastructure company? If you're not, I would say consider, uh, consider buying. And most importantly, is, is infrastructure core to the business or is it a distraction, right? Okay, so build variant number one, building from trunk. You'll also hear this called vanilla. Right? So this is going on the OpenStack website and going through the tutorial and building it from hand. If anybody was in my presentation yesterday, I, I kind of took, went through some of the steps that it takes to do this. And the long story sh short is it's really hard. It takes a lot of work. Um, there's no automation involved in building it straight from the OpenStack tutorial, right? Um, you're literally building each service relationship by hand, um, and it's, it's not fun. Um, you really can't get a lot of support in that model either because it's not a vendor-supported vendor, vendor supported configuration. You can't go and call up you know, you know, the, uh, the OpenStack open repair shop and say, hey, come, come fix this for me. That's not really an option. Um, it's inherently a snowflake because you built it yourself. You built it unique to your specific requirements, so it doesn't fit within a common reference architecture, most likely. Um, but there are some benefits, right? You know exactly how it works. 
and you're not tied to a vendor. So going back to the whole vendor lock-in thing, you know, nobody's, no, you're not beholden to anyone. But that means that it comes, there is no vendor support. So you have to think about, is that something, do we want somebody that we can call? Are we okay with paying for somebody that we can, that we can call? Um, you can also customize it almost as much as you want. Uh, again, going back to our three monkeys, if you've got the skill sets to do that in your company. Um, and then lastly, you know, upgrades are really tough in this model. It's still something that's pretty painful. A lot of the distributions have solved or, or nearly solved this problem. But if you're building it yourself from trunk code, upgrades are, are, are difficult. Okay, so build variant number two using a distribution. Um, so this is the Red Hat and Canonical and Mirantis, SUSE, um, others that I've forgotten. Um, so first thing, you know, you, you typically are limited somewhat in terms of the vendor selections, right? And each vendor has kind of a different approach to this, and I'm, I'm not going to go into all the specifics, but typically a distribution comes with a core set of services, uh, maybe some ancillary services, and that's kind of it. If you want to go and add on additional services into that cloud, you're kind of on your own going back to building it by hand. So it's not quite as customizable, um, and it does, you, it does tie you to that vendor, and therefore it costs money. Um, the good news is it's way easier to install. In any case, from any vendor, it's going to be much easier and, and save you a lot of time. Um, upgrades are easier. Like I said, most of the distributions have figured out how to automate upgrades in, in both in terms of the systems, the hosts, as well as the OpenStack distribution. Um, and therefore, the day-to-day -day operations are easier. And then lastly, obviously, you got someone to call when something goes wrong and things do go wrong. You've got somebody, hopefully, that's friendly on the other end of the phone that you can ask for help. So if you're building, you're building more than just a cloud. And this is something that is often forgotten. When you build kind of the, the TCO and ROI model for what this looks like within your company, um, a lot of times this gets glossed over. Because you're not just building servers and virtualization. You're, you have to build a whole practice around it, right? It takes process and operational excellence to support it and deliver a service that the business can actually rely on. It takes people. Um, it's not just standing up a cloud and saying, here guys, go have fun. All right, so now we'll switch to the buy methods. Um, and I call this consuming. So again, this is fundamentally different than building. You're turning to a vendor and saying, okay, go and serve my needs. And yes, you know, in a distribution model that we just talked about, you're still buying something from a vendor, but it's coming supported, but you're still putting that together yourself. This is literally, you want Horizon, and you want to go and start consuming resources. So where do you start, right? If you go down to the marketplace, um, and this was from two summits ago, but um, if you go down to the marketplace, there's 300 companies that all say that their thing is the best way to do it. So how do you navigate that? How do you find a partner or service provider that, that actually fits for your business? And it seems like it should be a fairly straightforward journey to navigate the ecosystem. You've got your cloud where you're going, and here you are, and it's a straight line. So let's go. <laughs> the reality is it's typically more like this, and you're going to go chasing that cloud and a vendor that can help you get there, and when you think you've found it, out comes the fire-breathing dragon. <laughs> and we have seen this lots and lots of times with our customers. They've come to us and said, we tried X, and it totally failed, and we spent tons of money help. So three ways to buy. Um, and these are the three kind of fundamentals. There's lots of variants of these. Um, the first is appliance, second is kind of SaaS slash appliance, which is a relatively new category, and the third is a hosted or managed service. So we'll talk about these. An appliance basically is a box that you buy, it gets shipped in a piece of cardboard, you unpack it, throw it in your rack, turn it on, and boom, you've got cloud. Um, there are some companies that are doing really cool things in this space, um, and it makes it Super easy, almost plug and play, simple to implement. Um, it's fully integrated with the hardware, so you're not worrying about you know, compiling in new drivers and some of the goofy stuff that we have to do when we build it ourselves. Downsides, it's typically limited to the hardware configuration that that vendor has identified as their reference architectures, which means if you're, if you're deploying one of the hyper-converged appliance vendors, 
um, inherently you're either going to waste some disk space or some memory or some CPU capacity as you scale out. So chances are their preset ratio is probably not going to be exactly yours. Um, it also means that you're 100% reliant on that vendor for support. So relatively new category in the past kind of 24 months or so, I call it the SaaS slash appliance model. Um, it's a little bit of a hybrid. So there's some companies now that are basically allowing you to bootstrap a box um, into a compute and storage node, and then the controller services run off in the cloud, not to overuse the word, but basically somewhere else. So that service provider has the portal, that service provider has all the control services sitting in their data center or a data center somewhere else, and you just have that compute and storage node. Um, it's an interesting model. It means that that other company is totally responsible for the hard part, which is setting up all the control services. So convenient, um, but it does mean that you're 100% reliant on that vendor, A, staying around, right? <laughs> Uh, and B, physically, if you lose connectivity, those control services are potentially broken. Might not be impacting to the workload on the cloud, but it certainly is impacting in your ability to provision. Um, like I said, it's a relatively new category, and there's a couple of players in the space that are, are doing um, interesting things here, so I'm, I'm interested to see how this plays out. I will note that it still means that you have to take on the kind of operational response, uh, responsibility for uh, providing support to your internal users. And then the last one um, is the hosted or managed service. So interesting thing about this, and this, this I could spend another day talking about on its own, because there are tons of choices. So there are a plethora of companies that will let you consume private custom cloud uh, in their data center and deliver it as a fully turnkey service, and you get Horizon, you can go spin stuff up. Um, and it is the purest consumption model. It's the closest to the likes of an Amazon or Azure in that you know, you're consuming cloud and you're having no responsibility for operating it whatsoever. Um, the downsides, because there are so many choices of providers, it's hard to find one that actually fits. So I've heard from our customers, they've said, hey, we really like your company because you guys are super flexible and, and you'll let us you know, choose how we want it and, and you know, you'll really customize the cloud. And then I've heard other customers say, we don't wanna work with you because you're super flexible <laughs> and you'll let us customize it. Um, so the point is you need to find a provider that is going to align with your desire to have something that's either really custom or fairly rigid. And there is a, 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 an argument to be made for both. Um, and then obviously it means that you're tied to that provider, right? So you better hope that they're a good partner. You better hope that they're gonna have your back and um, operate with the same level of excellence that you would as, as within your own company. So, Kind of building and buying, Here are the, here's kind of the five choices, I would say are the, the broad categories. Um, again, building from trunk or distribution, uh, and buying as an appliance, kind of the hybrid SaaS appliance model, or buying a hosted managed service. So, again, visual aids. <laughs> All right, so next step. You've decided how you're gonna do it, whether it's building or buying, now you need to make it easy for people to use. So at the end of the day, if you're building an OpenStack cloud within your enterprise, you're doing that to be a service provider to your users and consumers. Um, the easier it is to consume, the more likely you are, you are to drive adoption within the enterprise. So second part, when you build it as a proof of concept, build it with production in mind. This is not what you wanna do. <laughs> Um, if you build it as something that's inherently unreliable or come with risks, uh, then chances are people probably aren't gonna put important workload on it. And if they're not putting important workload on it, um, then that means you're not gonna have a successful proof of, proof of concept. Or if you build it this way and they don't know and something goes wrong and it goes down and that workload is, is impacted, people are gonna say, see, I told you that OpenStack thing isn't reliable, when it could have just been something like this. I saw some people nodding some heads um, I know that that was what my first one looked like, so. Um, and then keeping it simple. So if you spend any time going around to all the sessions here at the summit, uh, you'll hear about endless bar uh, barrage of uh, different uh, projects that you can implement within your cloud. So my recommendation is to really focus on the core services, compute and storage, 
you know, if there's a couple of things that you need that are really specific to your business, you need database as a service, that's fine, but keep the set limited. Um, I know personally when I'm going and doing this for fun, I want to implement everything because it's fun and I get all kinds of things to play with, um, but that's really counterproductive in a business environment. So I would suggest you set uh, a cadence for conducting surveys of your users and finding out what they're actually looking for. Do it on a regular basis so that your users know that there's a consistent process that you follow for uh, taking in user feedback and then considering new features to implement in, in, uh, you know, on a quarterly or, or semi-annual basis. The reason for this is the more things that you implement within that cloud, the more services you have to support, the more complexity, the more time consuming it, um, it becomes. Uh, and worst, it leads to choice or decision paralysis. And this happens a lot in the enterprise. Don't let it happen to you. If you become paralyzed, the whole thing grinds to a halt. Okay, so now we've got to drive adoption, right? We've built this proof of concept. We built it the right way. We decided how we were gonna either build or buy. We're up and running. We've got our core services. We've given accounts to all our users. So now we've got to get them hooked. Um, and this is going to lead into kind of business process, right? Like, let's assume that we made it easy and, we've, and everybody can go in and access it. Maybe you've done some training to show them how to consume it. If your business process doesn't catch up um, to this new way of consuming, you're not going to see adoption. So I'll tell you a little story. We had a customer three or four years ago that um, they had a, a really big uh, private cloud environment built on VMware. This was many years ago. Um, and at some point they realized that this company was spending a million dollars a month on Amazon, but it wasn't a budget line item, it was all of their IT users putting down their credit card and going and spinning up resources. So they said, aha, we're gonna go build our private cloud um, and give all of our users access to it so they can consume stuff and we're gonna save tons of money. And so they did that and they went from 42 days to 38 days in terms of implementation of new systems. Why? because they didn't adapt their business processes. What they did was they had the same requisition form that they used to requisition a bare metal server in the data center, and they applied that to virtual machines in their private cloud. And guess what? Amazon spending kept going up. So adapting the business process into a way that's nimble and flexible to keep up with the improvements that you're making in the technology is super important if you want to drive adoption. Secondly, test drives work. Right? There's a reason you go to the car dealership and they give you the keys and they say drive around and you only get to go two blocks, but that's okay. Um, it really does work. When you give your users access and you say, here's, here's this cool Horizon thing, you can go spin up whatever you need, it helps get them hooked when they see how easy it is compared to what are probably the previous ways of doing things that involve paperwork and email and everything else. So let your users into the system, encourage them to play with it and get comfortable with it. Okay, so. Yay, success. We've got users on our platform. Um, there's the cloud. Everybody's happy. They're using it. Now what do we have to do? <laughs> First thing, we've got to justify its existence. Now we've actually got some applications running in this cloud. We've got to, we've got to justify its existence because it's going to grow. Adoption's going to increase. And, oh, look, we've got to buy more hardware to support it. Well, somebody's going to say, tell me why, right? So you have to track how people are using resources. Um, two particular things that I like are Cloud Kitty and Intelligent OpenBook, both really good technologies to do this. Um, a lot of companies will use cloud uh, as the infrastructure as a service for business units or departments or subsidiaries. Um, and so you wanna track on a business unit basis, but also track and do chargeback and showback against specific initiatives that IT users might have. Um, that helps you justify the existence of this technology on a go-forward basis. And then secondly, we got to keep it healthy, right? So there's some stuff we have to monitor now. First, we got to monitor all the OpenStack services that are running in the platform. So Keystone and Nova, Neutron, stuff, all that good stuff, we got to make sure that it's running. This is important to build an uh, operational monitoring system with, with good rigor. Performance is important, so if, if all of a sudden it gets full and performance goes down, you're gonna have unhappy users, and again, they're gonna do that see, I told you so thing. Um, let's go back to the old way. So monitoring performance is important, um, and utilization for the same reason, but you gotta plan for growth too, right? 
So one thing that OpenStack doesn't really do out of the box very well is tell you how much of the kind of physical stuff you've built is actually being used on a consistent basis. So you've got to augment the capabilities um, so that you can see as that utilization is growing, you know when you're going to run out of, run out of capacity and can start adding. So I know everybody likes to take pictures of slides. Here's the photo slide. This summarizes kind of all this stuff. So feel free to take a picture of that. And um, I'll open it up for questions. Sure. So uh, the, qu the question was, what's an example of where agile technology uh, can help you capture an opportunity? So um, we, had a, we had a customer, um, a large uh, global conglomerate, uh, manufacturing conglomerate, and they um, had this opportunity to go and buy a subsidiary from one of their competitors that would strengthen their market position um, and actually let them become a, a, the, the dominant player in their particular vertical. Um, and they had a really short window of time to do it, right? They didn't have the infrastructure. They had kind of rigid process. Um, and so they were able to basically say, hey, um, we've got this really flexible OpenStack architecture. We can add nodes in. We don't have to re-architect anything. We don't have to do forklift upgrades of big SAN equipment. Um, and they were able to extract the IT uh, assets of that subsidiary um, you know, it, within like a 90-day window, which normally in that kind of case would, would be a six or nine-month process. Um, and they had to do it within that window of, of, of time, otherwise they wouldn't have been able to make the acquisition. It had to do with a whole bunch of kind of environmental and regulatory stuff, but um, that's, that's, a, that's a real example. Um, and I know companies like Netflix are all often looking at new markets where they can start streaming. So when they announced um, a year and a half ago or so that streaming would be available everywhere, the ability to quickly adapt and deploy reference architecture that was uh, easily repeatable and scalable played a big part in that. So everybody wants to get rid of the vendor login, but aren't you at the risk of locking yourself in with the employees that run this? <laughs> uh, so the, the, the question is, um, if you eliminate vendor lock-in, do you get locked into the to your employees? Um, yeah, no, that's 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 a really good point, actually. So, you know, getting back to the kind of the inspirational success stories, right? Um, you know, Walmart has a team. I, I don't know how many it is now, but hun in the hundreds of developers in Walmart Labs that are supporting this, right? So, so for sure, there is there is um, you become dependent on the skill sets that you have in house, and that's actually speaks to the the build versus buy, right? If you're building it all yourself then you have to have the people to do that and you gotta keep them, right? It's not a build it and then forget it, walk away. Um, so if, if you wanna be not locked into people, maybe the service provider partner avenue is the way to go. Any other questions? All right, so uh, Contact information is here. Um, if you want a copy of this, just send me a quick email. I'm happy to send it to you. Um, and if you uh, enjoyed this and found it useful, I'd love some feedback on the, uh, on the app. Thanks, everyone.